Hey everybody, it's Amanda Radke for another episode of The Heart of Rural America. If you've been following along for the introductory episodes, my whole goal is to highlight great people I meet across the country or I connect with online who are doing innovative things in agriculture to enhance their their businesses, to uh, improve relationships with the family they work alongside every day, and to ultimately uh, be providers of the essentials of life for communities and and people around the world. And and so today's guest, I don't think we've ever met in person, but we've connected online. And uh, you might know her as Oh That's Chelsea on social media. She has a massive following on social media uh, where her family uh, talks about their life on the farm and ranch and what they do together as a family. So Chelsea, welcome. Can you tell us a little bit about who you are, where you're from, and, and what your family does? Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. I am the sixth generation on our family's farm and I farm and ranch with my family in central North Dakota. So we grow commercial cattle, corn, soybeans, pinto beans, seed oats. My parents have a feedlot and a feed business on the farm. And then my husband has a fencing supply company off the farm. So the wheels are always turning in one direction or the other. <laughs> and I didn't say your last name, but Chelsea Erdman is her last name. So if for everyone, like, who is this Chelsea girl? Um, so I, I, I can relate to that, to having a lot of irons in the fire. Um, how do you guys kind of juggle it all? We learn as we go. I would say that we're still finding our rhythm. I have only been back on the farm full time since 2018 and same with my brother. So we're trying to find how this all works to have at one time up until last fall, there was four generations working on the farm together okay. daily. And my kids do jobs. They're not quite full efficiency yet, but they're doing okay. jobs. So we're still figuring it out. And your kids are how old? Four and a half, almost three and almost one. So I always joke because my kids are young too that one day they're going to be useful. Right now they're just they're just learning by observing, and uh, the key is to keep them out of trouble or from getting hurt while they're just kind of tagging along. So uh, on your social media, you you post that the kids are with you, they're they're alongside you in the in the combine or the tractor or in the truck, whatever you're doing. What's what's your best best advice to people that are kind of navigating farm life with young kids? Ooh, I would say that my best advice is something that I struggle to take in myself mm -hmm. and it's taking a breath, slowing down and letting it be in my mind. I'm trying to continue at peak efficiency as yeah. fast as I could before I had kids. And now there's three kids in tow or at least a couple at a time. And it just doesn't go as fast as it did when I was by myself. So what really matters here? What are we trying to do? Yep. I, I can totally relate to that. I'm very hard on myself if I don't get done in the day what I had set out to do. And I have to remind myself, this is more than just, like you said, that peak efficiency on the farm. This is a multi-generation thing. And if I want my kids to be invested in it and be a part of it, yeah, we have to take the time to teach them along the way also. And and uh, it it is a lesson in patience, which, which is tough. Um, so tell me a little bit about why you post the things you do or, or how you kind of approach social media uh, because you you do do a lot of posting on money issues finance financial management uh, being back on the farm and giving advice to people how did that all come to be i've really enjoyed the challenge of the money side of the farm the way that we can take a business and find tweaks find economies of scale find efficiencies and make the farm into something that it wasn't before as a mm -hmm. way to weather the cycles that we will continue to ride. And that part really gets my brain turning. I feel like that's something that I can pull ahead and do for our farm. My dad has always said that we are all bringing something back to the farm that's different. And I was never here for my muscles. I'm not the strongest. I'm not the tallest. I cannot do that for the farm, but I can find ways for a farm to be more profitable. I, I totally agree with that. It's It's been humbling for me to farm alongside my husband and realize that I don't have the skills he does. And and, and likewise, I, I bring a different set of talents to the table that, than what he does. And, and so how can we work together in a way that's complementary that can help advance the operation forward and and be this this unit or this this team? And, and I think that is important. Uh, when you come back to an our operation, I, I came back to the family farm after college in, in 2009 and, 
And so many, so often, and I wonder if you see this too, I see young people that are super eager to come back, but they want to change a bunch of things. And then there's that kind of butting of heads with multiple generations. Have you seen that or have you experienced that? And any advice you have for navigating the dynamic with multiple generations as you have new ideas and new energy coming back to the operation? We definitely have the totem pole here also that yeah. it will take, it'll take time and it'll take dedication and it'll take sweat equity to climb the totem pole. And I think that we have discussed before the respect aspect of someone that has been here for years and they are extremely willing to let us try things, but also they have seen so much more than we give them credit for. And we are reminded of that not too often, but enough to say, let's just get your boots wet. Let's try this. Let's see what's out here and let's work together rather than having somebody be too eager and just run off with things without enough experience. Yeah. I mean, that was kind of my humbling experience as a young person was, oh, hey, I, yeah, I might have brought a lot of ideas back home from college, but we're still matching our production method to the environment we live on and the markets we have access to. And dad has, there's a reason that dad or grandpa did things a certain way. It's because of the school of hard knocks where you learn it the hard way and then you make those expensive mistakes and you, you adjust. And so I think I had to have my own uh, evolution of a learning curve of figuring out what what works and, and why it all kind of pieces together and then how I could add to the pie. And that's what I see young people too, where they think just because I show up, you mentioned sweat equity, like I show up, put in this sweat equity and someday this is all just going to advance and, and be mine. And, and I always tell young people, number one, to make sure their sweat equity is, is valued or there is a plan or some kind of written documentation of what is the trajectory here moving forward. I've seen 42 year old men, you know, have a falling out with their parents and then they're starting at square one because they didn't understand that their sweat equity didn't have a dollar amount to it. Um, but I, I think with all that, I guess it's, it's, it's a balance. It's a balance of working alongside family members and then also trying to figure out a way to add to the pie instead of just taking a piece of the pie. And so you had mentioned that, you know, trying to find your fit and what you could bring to the table, kind of what is your extra slice of the pie that you're, you're adding to the family business? I think it's on the profitability side, the money side. I feel like I have the ability to look at this as a business more than everyone else. The nostalgia and the lifestyle and the love for what they're doing is an incredible quality to see life through. And I don't look at it quite that way. My glasses are a little bit different rose colored and I see the business more so for the business. And I also feel like it's easier for me to separate what working on the business means versus working in the business and the mm -hmm. culture that we have around here has been so much working in the business that it'll take a little bit of time and practice to step out to work on the business. Okay. So unpack that a little bit. What is the distinction or what's the difference there? In my mind, when I think about it, we can be so reactionary. Everything mm -hmm. that we do in agriculture comes at us so quickly, especially for diversified operations, that we go from calving to planting to haying to spraying, then it's weaning, harvest, feeding, calving again. There is no time to sit down and say, what do we actually want to be doing? Mm -hmm. Are our efforts efficient? Are we spending our time doing 80% of what is making us 20% of the revenue we're spending most of our time in what is bringing back revenue. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that we necessarily always have that because we're a small business. We are good at ranching. We are good at farming, but are we good business owners? Sure. And you, you even post on your social media, uh, you had written in case you needed to hear this today, your ranch and your farm is a business. What was the reaction to saying things like that? It, do people, have they just bought into that this is a hobby, this is a lifestyle, and we should love what we do, even if we're, you know, in the red every year? I think it all depends. I think there's some people that are in the red and maybe don't know they are because there's always an operating note there and it's something that they continue to do. There's enough equity that it'll hold itself afloat for another generation at least. And then there yeah. are others that see it as a business in between. And maybe people that want to see it as a business but are so bogged down by what has to come day to day that they don't get time to sit down and say, hey, what do we want? What can we plan for? What can we do differently? 
So with that business mindset, what are some changes or tweaks that you've made in the last couple of years that have helped the family farm? Oh, goodness. Um, good question. I would say that we are still, <laughs> we're still working through the little things. So like we mentioned earlier, when I had big ideas that I brought home, I had the privilege to work at a John Deere dealer before coming back to the farm full time, which was incredible for personal growth and development and understanding how a business works, such as a corporation, that was really helpful. Anyways, I would bring new ideas home and I thought that they checked all the boxes. Everything I could think of, this idea was a slam dunk home run. I would bring them to my dad and he would bring up three to five points that I had not even considered why they wouldn't work for us. And that was the humbling experience for me that I thought I knew what was going on and mm -hmm. I really didn't. There were so many behind the scenes factors. So we are still, I'm still learning, very much so learning, especially from my dad, getting experience under my belt. And I think it's just the small things of, do we have to sell our calves at the same time every year? Do we have to continue to stay on a feed program that has been the same? What is the balance between doing tradition so you can hit the markets and you're not moving too many factors around so you miss an opportunity and what is chasing an opportunity. So I think in summary, my husband has really taught me to be an opportunity chaser, to not get mm -hmm. stuck in, this is what we do, this is why we do it, to always have your eyes open to, can we make money doing that? Would we enjoy it? Is it worth the risk? Let's do it. Yep, yep. And so you do Money Mondays, where you're pretty frank and open about some of the financial decisions that, that you make on the farm. And I, I guess what's been kind of the feedback to that or what's been something that's really resonated with people that you've shared? Because money seems to be like that, that word, that dirty word nobody wants to talk about in agriculture. In general, I think it's exactly that, that people enjoy talking about it and have really enjoyed the opportunity to lift the veil. Let's talk about it. Let's dig into it. This is something that we are all assumed to know and assumed to be well-versed in, but yet we can't talk about it and we can't discuss with other people what their trials have been or what their wins have been and how they work through those. And especially for me, I think it's easy to drive throughout the neighborhood and see that your neighbors are always winning. They're always winning and you never see yeah. the losses. And it's hard to lose, to lose big money and recover from that. So I think just being open with people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your transparency is is what really attracted me to your page and and following along and wanting me to have you on this podcast because I, I we're losing farms at a, a rapid rate, especially in the livestock side of things. And to me, you know, people can wax poetic about all the things we need the government to do to fix it, to make things more fair in the marketplace. And and I don't want to negate any of that at all, that it, it is important to get involved and call your congressman or, or be at the county commissioner meetings or all these things that could impact your way of life. But at the end of the day, a lot of people are going bankrupt and, and or the next generation isn't coming back to the farm. And so to me, the biggest question is, how can we in the private sector find profitability when the deck is is often stacked against us. And and so I guess just looking at the livestock side of things, how optimistic are you or, or how are you looking at the livestock as a business and not just a lifestyle and a tradition of something we like to do? I really love the cow side. So I would say on the farm, I'm more drawn to cows. There's a nostalgia there. I feel more helpful in the cows. So I'm very optimistic. And to me, yeah. cows yeah. will not go away. Even though when you run the math, the labor hours, the amount that you work for the money that you get. I mean, that just doesn't pencil out the same. I, I can see why, why people are leaving. So what can, what can we change about that? And my husband and I were actually just watching some market reports and we found it fascinating that pairs were selling for $1,900 when we can sell cows on their own and we can sell cows on their own for significantly more than that. So what opportunity is this showing us here? What is the market asking for? And that's something that my dad taught us, we used to buy short-term cows, calve them both, early wean, and then finish both the cow and the calf, but only if the numbers are right. So from the very beginning, we were taught to look at market reports, look for opportunity, only if the numbers are right, get in, figure out a way to make money, and then roll and get out. So tell us a little bit more about your cattle operation, what you guys are doing over there, and, and what you're looking at in the, the months ahead as we kind of round out the year. 
we have a very unique situation here. So back in the 90s, I believe, they used to have a beautiful herd, foundation herd, been here, but both my grandpa and my dad were sick, so they sold that off. And I grew up as a child calving short-term cows, which taught me more than I think calving great cows would do because short-term cows, there's a reason they were sold. They were going to kill and they were saved and we calved cows that were terrible mothers, had bad bags, bad attitudes. It was quite the experience. I learned 11. We decided to get back into our keeper cow herd. So we bought, I believe, 30 cows and from there have grown that rapidly over the last 12 years into our main herd. So our main herd was put together from dispersions, put together from neighbor cows, and we have grown it since. So it's definitely not a foundation herd. It is not beautiful by any means and it's a work in progress. But it has worked for us, and we are working our way toward having cows that work for us. We talk about that a lot. That is something that really means a lot to me, especially after having short-term cows. How can these cows work for us more than we work for them? And then when we early wean, all of the calves go to my parents' feedlot, and they finish them out here, which is really neat to watch. So our our genetic um, ideas of how we're going to do things, we breed more for terminal traits than we do for weaning weight or things like that just because we do retain ownership or my parents retain ownership and then we send them on down the way. Now do you have any specific breed or or a program that you're selling into on the feedlot side? Yes we go with Black Angus so we can get into CAB. My parents did buy a semitol dispersion just because they wanted to see what that could do for us and that has been quite an eye opener. They're, they're okay. not my favorite cows by any means. I'll tell anybody they're not my favorite, <laughs> but their calves, their calves are really awesome. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Sometimes it's, it's a little trial and error to figure out what kind of what your thing is. I, I get that. And, and so I, I spent a lot of time thinking about the commercial cow calf guy and that just really knowing that 85% of our beef supply is held captive by four major players, big packers, two, couple of them foreign owned. And we often hear that the prices at the sale barn are, they're not getting a fair shake or that there isn't enough competition to, to really capture the value for what these producers are doing. And and I guess I just want your thoughts on that. How can the cow calf commercial guy be profitable? What are some things that they can do to maybe move the needle in a more positive direction, especially right now, with, with prices being where they are. There might be some some hidden opportunities that maybe you're thinking about um, that you could share. We did creep feed earlier this year than we ever have. And a few of the pens are already through two feeders of creep feed and now they're on an 80-20 accuration mix. So right now, according to my dad's projections, he can look at calves and tell you how much they weigh. That's not a gift that I have yet been able to master. But he thinks we will be 50 pounds heavier than we were last year when a few in our area we're not sure they're going to make that or a little bit less because of the heat and the flies. The flies have been so awful here this summer. Mm -hmm. So that is something that we're excited to see. And another discussion we have often is what size cows should we have? We often had big cows because then when we would roll them as short-term cows, bigger cows pack on more pounds, you sell more pounds, you get more money. When we're in a commercial herd, does a medium sized cow take less to feed and can you get a bigger calf? So we're doing a lot of math on what percentage size calf does the cow wean off and are we putting too much money into these big cows that just eat and eat and eat and eat? Those big cows sure look good out there though, don't they? It's like They're beautiful. I, I, get, I find myself uh, falling into that too. Like, man, look at her out there. But then it's like, okay, is she weaning off the size of calf she needs to, to justify her existence? So I, I totally get that. Um, kind of switching gears. You have recently moved. You've, you've downsized a little bit. You're kind of in transition. I see you just got yourself a brand new combine, or maybe it's not, maybe it's new to you. I'm not sure, but, uh, what's going on kind of in your, your family life and, and kind of shifting things to, to keep moving the family business forward. My husband owned his own business and it was 40 miles south. So when we got married, we it worked really great for him and as someone that was by myself, easy to commute 40 miles to and from the farm every day. It was fine. And when we got married, we knew that we would move, but it would take time to get things lined up, figure out what we were going to do and make cash to have it happen. So finally now, six mm-hmm. years later, we are in the process. We sold that house. We're building a shop only eight miles from the farm. I'm very excited to okay. only run back and forth eight miles. So we're doing that. 
living in a rental house in between and trying to hold it all together because projects like this, they're taking a lot of money and it yep. comes with surprise costs along the way that we were not expecting. So yes, just trying to hold it all together in the meantime. I, uh, we priced out a kind uh, not really a shouse, but it kind of was going to have some living quarters. We we're going to have it as our, our sale barn for cattle sales and then a warehouse for my retail. And man, right now, or when we priced it out, it was like everything was still COVID pricing. It was just wild and astronomical. Is, is that kind of what you saw as well with, with the costs and, and do you see that going down or I guess there it's kind of a catch 22 because interest rates could go up as the price of goods goes down too. So what are your thoughts on that? I would say that we have seen some things that stayed high, some things that have come down and I'm glad that we went for it. Yeah. We had talked about waiting for a recession to come and hanging on to our money, seeing if we could make it any further. And now from what mm -hmm. I've read, we might not even hit a recession. They were calling it a soft landing. Perhaps it won't be what we thought it would be. And I have always found that just going for it has worked out for us in the long term rather than waiting for the perfect time. Go for yep. it, figure it out. You'll you'll get it some way or the other. Yep, yep. I uh it, it is interesting just kind of seeing the cycles of agriculture and the economy and the ups and downs. And it is nice when you can time things on the low. Uh, my husband and I bought our acreage that we live on uh, right after the housing bubble burst at, in 08. <laughs> so it was like very depressed pricing. And I think back like, wow, the timing was just perfect and aligned because I mean, it's just quadruple, you know, valued what it was when we got it. And so sometimes timing is, it makes all the difference. But then sometimes with investments in agriculture, it's like, man, it's going to be more expensive tomorrow than it was today. I mean, land, perfect example. It's like the best time to buy it was, I don't know, when we were in third grade or something. <laughs> um, and so I, you you made me laugh on your post because, or when we had talked, uh, that you miss your dish, dishwasher quite a bit, huh? You're, you're without a dishwasher right now. Did I lose you? Yes, we are. And I hate to say first oh. world. Am I back? Yeah. I yes, I can hear you now. Okay. I yes, you're back. You're back. Problems. I hate to say first world problems because I am definitely capable of running the dishwasher with my hands in the sink. But it's amazing how accustomed yep. we get to certain luxuries in life. And yes, we're without a dishwasher. My sink is full of yep. dishes. I'm not keeping up with it as much as I anticipated I could. And and I think too, you know, we say all oh, first world problems, but when you're running so many different businesses, you have so many irons in the fire and you've got little kids, it's amazing what some of those things can make a difference that, I mean, I'd be washing dishes all day with my four kids. It would just never stop. So it's, to me, I really felt for you there because I know in the grand scheme of things, being efficient with your time, there's probably a million other things you'd rather be doing than, than washing dishes at the sink, whether it's playing with your kids or or doing chores outside with the cattle or everything else in between. Um, so that's been that's been kind of a change of pace for you. Uh, tell us a little bit about the legacy books that you sell. Um, I, I have them myself and they're amazing. You know, we talk about how this is a business and it, it's great it's great to run the business, but also there is that family aspect of it. And your legacy books allow people to kind of document the journey along the way. Tell us how those came to be and where people can buy them and, and what they all include in the books. As far as I can remember, which would be my whole life because they've been playing it my whole life. There is this game that our family has played on New Year's Eve consistently for years and years. I asked my grandma when they started and she said, when she married into the family, they were already doing it. So okay. I'm not sure okay. where it started, but it's been here ever since 1965. It's called Hokey Pokey, and they take a coin, a cracker, and a wedding ring, and they put them under three cups, and then you mix them all around, and every person gets to pick up a cup three times. And if you pick up the cup that has a cracker underneath, that signifies that we should have a good crop. If you choose the ring, that signifies we should be lucky. And if you choose the coin, that obviously means we should see money. So we tally those all up at the end after everyone in the family has gone and it shows what do we think is coming to us this year? A good crop, good money, or luck. And it's been fascinating to see how that goes. And my mom then thought, well, does this really work? So she has a stenographic notebook and she takes notes. So every year she writes down, did we see the money? Did we see the crop? 
did we see luck? And all of this history, all of these notes, all of these memories are in this notebook and it didn't feel secure enough or special enough or yeah, yeah like something that we could flip through and look through our memories. So that's where the memory book came from. Something okay. that you can do as a family tradition, plan for the next year, and then at the end, write down a few memories because it's a lot to sort through the pictures. It's a lot to sort through the memories, but if you can have a few highlighted to flip through in the book. I think that's so special for families. Well, it's kind of been a wake up call for me too, because I, I want to be able to communicate to my kids what it was like when we first got started and just like how poor we were, you know, what, what we had to do in the early days, whether it was renting out every shed on our place or first year we were married, we rented out the basement at the farmhouse to tech kids just to help pay the mortgage. And it took us a couple years to even buy cattle. And then I just trying to remember how much did we pay for those first run of cows and, and what did, how did we make it work? How did we pencil it out? And, and then you, it, you know, time goes on and you look back 10, 15 years and you start forgetting some of those finer details, but those are what sort of shape you and, and make, make the business, I don't know, tell the story. Uh, so what, what has been the response, I guess, from other people that have purchased these books and are starting to kind of pencil out those memories? I think it's the same as you. We want to hang on to these memories. And like you said, with time, the frayed edges aren't afraid as much as they were in the beginning those yep. little details yep. of how incredibly gritty we had to be get lost and that's that's a true story of the resilience that we have built and it's been really fun to hear people get a chance to talk to their family about things that they maybe wouldn't discuss and a different way to reflect on the year mm -hmm. so where can people buy where can they follow along on your blog or social media give us all your handles and, and where people can find you First and foremost, you can find the books on amandaradke.com in oh. her shop. You <laughs> yeah. can also find them on ohthatschelsea.com. And I am on Instagram and Facebook as oh, that's Chelsea. Awesome. And I guess we only have a few minutes left on the show, but what advice, maybe let's start with what advice would you have for the older generation as they're welcoming maybe the next generation onto the farm and then do the flip side of what's a what, good advice for the young to the, uh, as they enter into the business? Oh, goodness. Advice. I think what I would say instead is thank you so much to my parents for making this work. Having my kids here has been the greatest blessing. I'm not emotional, but being a mom has made me emotional. Um, <laughs> yeah. It is it is such a gift to see what they have learned here. And when we were talking earlier about what's important, even if they never come back to the farm and they never want to stay in agriculture, what they understand about life is mm -hmm. absolutely invaluable. It's so special. So thank you. Oh, I wish you guys could see her because she's tearing up and now I'm going to tear up because I feel the same way. It's, it's these life skills that you, there's no better setting to raise kids than where they can see the circle of life. They can see the risks. They can see mom and dad go through hard stuff when things don't always work out and they don't. And, and when you're, maybe making mistakes that cost tens of thousands of dollars. Like how do, how does mom and dad work through those things? And, and sometimes I, I just hope, I know they're watching, I know they're soaking it up and it's like, man, I, I hope that one day when they're 25 or 45, like some of this stuff that they walked through alongside of us, it, it kicks in for themselves that they, oh yeah, mom and dad did this and I can I can get through this hard stuff too. And I, I don't know, seeing the circle of life and new calves being born, but fill in the freezer with the beef that you raised too. It, there's just, there's just some very important seeds that we're planting with the next generation. And I, I, I think you sum it up very well. And, and just having that gratitude and that humility too, that it's, we're kind of on the shoulders of the people that came before us and, and getting mm -hmm. to, to be a part of this life where so few get, get to have the opportunity. It, it is, it is a blessing among blessings. Uh, so I guess any, any final words for folks, I, anything on your mind right now as, as you're, in the midst of, of harvest and, and kind of moving into another season on the farm? I think the dishwasher is sticking in my mind. In your perspective <laughs> of, of, yes, I hired a house cleaner because I needed help. I absolutely could not do this on my own. And the dishwasher saved time and all these little things that we can sometimes make ourselves feel guilty for or are just not able to juggle it. 
the help counts and it goes so much farther than I think it does. And yes, it's the little things, the house cleaner, the dishwasher, someone helping you get groceries, all the little things, that efficiency makes all the difference. Well, I'm glad you said that too, because there's one of my favorite things that you wrote on your, your social media was that um, you said the secret to getting it all done. Is it getting up early? No. Is it being efficient? No. It's your village. It, it takes a village. And yeah, I couldn't do this without grandma and grandpa dropping off the kids when we got to work cattle or, you know, having sisters close by. It, it's it's that village. And and that's the great thing about agriculture is we have this, this great big village. Um, so thank you for being a part of my village too. I, I it, Even though we haven't met in real life, I do feel um, kind of just a kindred spirit and getting to hear your story. And I really appreciate you coming on the show. I do too. I feel like as women in egg, mothers in egg, the village of seeing what can be done for mothers and support for mothers is really important. And that's part of the reason I'm on social media. So thank you to you too. Yeah. This is Amanda Radke on the heart of rural America. We'll see you next time along the dusty trail.